Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Welcome to the Reality OS. I'm Peter Duke, and I'm joined with Tra by Tracy Connors today, and we are the Mulder and Scully of the interwebs. How are you doing today, Tracy? I'm good, Peter. I was just thinking we should throw that design up for sale. Which design? The uh, Think Different. Think Different? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good idea. Do we um, need permission from anyone? I don't think so. In fact, I know where the files are. So. <laughs> I have them, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a crazy week, huh, Tracy? Oh, it's never, it's nonstop, Peter. Yeah. So you you pointed this story out to me this week uh, that that um, that we've been trying to unravel, and it's the uh, it's the uh, Tim Pool cat catnapping catnapping. <laughs> so it's a it's a double entendre, right? If you steal a cat or you hold a cat hostage, you're catnapping. Is that the, is that the way it goes? I, I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> but I know that that makes people think that he's asleep at the wheel or something like this, or he's just taking a little break and snoozing. But no, Tim yeah. Poole has been accused by the uh, Daily Beast of holding a cat hostage. And it's not just uh, anybody who's writing the story. It's Will Sommer, who is like uh, the uh, agent provocateur of of the uh I don't even know how to describe Will Summer. He he's a guy who's always writing hit pieces against uh I I would say the populist truth movement. This was the first that I had ever heard of him. I guess I don't always check bylines. So I appreciate you for doing that and saying, Oh, it was Will Summer. Let me dig into him a little bit for you. So <laughs> see, there we go. Will Summer, CIA agent. <laughs> Thanks, Madricky. Yeah. Yeah, except yeah, he's he's probably a uh, Harvard. I'm saying Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, CIA, as opposed to like Claremont, Stanford, CIA. East Coast, not West Coast. East Coast, CIA, right? Exactly. Gotcha. Okay, so I saw this headline. This came out. You can see this is all my version of it noted up. So you're going to see highlights, underlines, commentary, etc. On here. So this was published on Thursday morning at 5.01 a.m. and then he updated it the following morning probably to get more clicks. So I love the headline, YouTube star Tim Pool's news site collapses amidst allegations he took a cat hostage. So when you read that, the first thing that I thought at least was that, oh, TimCast.com has been deplatformed. Right. It's gone. And I'm like, well, I hope I get my money back because I think I've been pretty clear on this show that I'm a fan of Tim's. I watch his show. I'm I'm a um, card-carrying subscriber of TimCast.com. I'm part of the behind-the-scenes people back there or whatever they call their bonus content people. So I then I thought, no, that that's not true. I just watched a video of his this morning. So what's going on here? And then I and, love- and, and, and he's talking <laughs> about how he's expanding and he's doing well and he's hiring people and all kinds <laughs> yeah. of other stuff. Yeah. Um, well, the, the the link to the same story on the Daily Beast website reads, right-wing YouTube star accused of holding a cat hostage. And then the subline is, are you kidding me? Yeah, so, so that made it to this one too. Are you so kidding the, me? So the bad puns are going around. Yes. So right off the bat, the subhead is Tim Pool's disgruntled ex-partners. So should these people be trusted at all as sources? I would say no, but let's continue. 
They say that he used a cat as a bargaining chip in an ugly business negotiation. Poole says he's innocent, but still Will Summers persists. So here's the photo they tried to use. And right there, Tim has tried to keep his location pretty quiet. They've kind of thrown red herrings out about where they are. and Yeah, they've semi-doxed him. Yes. yes. So this is the flag of Maryland with a cat. And it looks like <laughs> it might as well have a newspaper held up behind it. I'm not sure why they've got the red alert bu bubble, but and then they've got Tim's face in the corner. Well, because they want everyone to think that this is an emergency and this is an impending something or other. It's, it's why the, I have the word breaking blocked on Twitter. So <laughs> news to anybody, if you want to get my attention, do not use the word breaking. <laughs> oh, okay. Noted. Okay. So I love this. All is not well in the burgeoning media empire of YouTube political commentator Tim Poole amid an acrimonious falling out over who controls the future of a dis digital news site that Poole helped launch. And the YouTube star is facing accusations from former partners that he used a cat named Betsy as a hostage in business Not Betsy. No. <laughs> Only handing the pet over after police were called. So this sounds really serious, right? So the uh, two it reminds, it reminds me of the old National Lampoon cover, buy this magazine or we'll kill this dog. <laughs> oh, we should find that and throw I, it up. Somewhere. I'll find it while you're reading. Keep okay. going. So this is where we introduce one of the two business partners. He was trying to use my cat as leverage. Emily Molly, Betsy's owner, and a former pool business said Emily Molly. Uh, Betsy's owner and a former pool, pool business partner. So Poole says that he never had custody of the cat whose return to Molly was eventually arranged through an animal shelter and a Maryland sheriff's lieutenant. Okay. Okay. So here we go. We're going to take an odd turn with this story right here. When he's not facing cat related accusations, <laughs> <laughs> which is 99.9% .9 of the time, Pool is living the life of a YouTube star. His videos, based on Pool's background as a liberal reporter who became a Trump voter after feeling alienated from the modern left, which I fact checked as being partially true. Tim was doing videos for way longer than Trump was even a political figure. So these videos have amassed more than 1.1 billion cumulative views. He has a multi-million dollar mansion in the Maryland woods. So, so multi-million dollar mansion. So I, the average price in Los Angeles of any house is over a million dollars at this point. I would be willing to bet that the average price in most metropolitan areas of the United States is over a million dollars. So that's, an interesting categorization. I, I would love to see what his 2,500 square foot on an acre uh, mansion looks like, but I keep going. So. I think he's got more than an acre, but yes, your point is taken. Yeah. See, so it's same observation as you, Peter. This must be a boomer reference. The National Lampoon's <laughs> buy the magazine or we'll shoot the dog. Um, yeah, it is. And I'm going to, I have it actually, so I'm going to bring it up right now. Just share share that with you so that you can. <laughs> so that's my boomer reference. Yes, and I'll never forget seeing that on the magazine rack in Seven Eleven, and just like almost blowing my uh, my Slurpee through my nose. It was pretty good. <laughs> I bought that. I bought that issue. Do you still have it? No, but you can get them on you can get them on eBay, which is where I found this uh, nice. photograph. This is when the National Lampoon was great. The uh, the writers were were uh, uh, Bill Murray and John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and all of the people that Lauren Michael stole and created Saturday Night Live with were all writers for the National Lampoon. It was it was really the heyday. Right. But we'll go back to your thing. All right. So his multi-million dollar mansion in the woods, and I wrote, so who cares? Like, what is this? I'm just so confused as what any of this has to do with a cat. Uh, complete with a podcast studio and a skate park. 
Donald Trump invited him to the White House. I wrote, fact check, false. Trump no, he did, did not invite him. To... Uh, right. Uh, they yes, make but... this seem like he was personally invited. Right. Donald it... Trump did not personally invite Poole to the White House. They had that social media summit that I checked. It was all arranged by Dan Scavino. Right. And I think he invited somebody. And it in... resulted in bupkis. Correct. Okay. <laughs> but but we're not going to say that. We're just going to say Donald Trump invited him to the White House. Right. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. So Poole's business has boomed even as he faces accusations, again with the accusations, that he's a major vector for right-wing disinformation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just so absurd. It's, it, 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 yeah, it's, I mean, your laugh says it all, but keep going. A recent report, which we all know how great and accurate those reports are, from a consortium of election integrity groups. Did Are those the ones we read about in the in the Time magazine, perhaps? A consortium? The election oh, yeah. oh, yeah, that's right. The uh, What did they call that? I can't remember what the word was. Keep going. Yeah. Um, listed him. Pool, alongside the likes of Donald Trump Jr. and pro-Trump lawyer Sidney Powell as a, quote, super spreader for false election information. Okay. You know, you know, there is no journalist uh, or commentary or commentator on the internet that makes more um, uh, citation of, of their own bias and doubt uh, than Tim Pool, like he, he, in fact, he spends most of his time explaining why whatever it is that he's about to say is not necessarily his opinion, but that he's just reporting it, and that he bends over backwards in order to kind of explain the multiple different ways that people could interpret um, the news items that he's talking about, um, almost to the point of absurdity. It's almost as if every video has to live on its own. Um, because if you have any provenance in having watched him before, you would know or assume that, but he just bends over backwards on every broadcast to make sure that you understand where he's coming from, what he means. And he brags about how he, he's a quote unquote milk toast fence sitter. <laughs> exactly. Well, and this idea that he's a super spreader, he goes out of his way too, to show you, oh, this is, I think he uses that, uh, news guard. Yep approved sources, which is some Microsoft thing that says whether or not this source can be credibly trusted for real. Well, they, they were, I think they were bought by Microsoft. Okay. Okay. So even though he was labeled as a super spreader by this report issued by a consortium of election integrity groups, uh, that doesn't appear to dissuade his more than 3 million YouTube subscribers who can pay twenty one ninety nine for a t-shirt bearing the image of pool's trademark beanie. Great. I think anyone I, can pay for that. I, I think anyway, Tim, I think he did a, a a video more than a year ago. I think when when he passed CNN. So, uh, as far as people watching him on YouTube, um, that is, there are more people that watch Tim Pool than watch CNN on YouTube. And at that point, um, uh, it was after he did that video that I think that people really started to uh, see him as a threat. But um, continue. But if this is what they've got to take him down, <laughs> they need to try way harder. <laughs> well, I, I have a feeling that he really is this milk toast guy who skateboards in his backyard and live streams it. And now they're trying to use that as a weapon against him. So. <laughs> right. It's like, wait a minute. That guy figured out how to beat the news at their own game and do a better job than they did to the point where he gets to live in a multi-million dollar mansion with his own skate park. Huh. Interesting. Pretty good. So, and, yeah, and, ju and just to be clear, like it's not like he's done a lot of cement pool work. Like his skate park is mostly plywood ramps. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's it's not. I mean, I've seen skate parks that are, you know, the, the skate park they have in Venice Beach, for example. That's a serious skate park. But uh, putting up some plywood ramps, that's hardly, uh, you know, uh, palatial. Keep going. Correct. So the allegations that Poole used a cat as a bargaining chip in a business dispute goes <laughs> dispute go beyond the fate of Betsy, who's now back in with Molly in Los Angeles. Okay. 
So then can't, uh, all right. Uh, the fracas sheds new light on how Poole and his co-founders failed to launch a news site amid infighting, despite more than a million dollars in crowdfunded backing. So I just made a note here, like where did that money go? Like obviously there's gonna be some insinuation about that. I bet it's down below, right? Spoiler alert, they never returned to that question. But they're trying to, he, Will Summer here is trying to insinuate obviously that his multi-million dollar mansion was somehow bought with this money from the crowdfunding. So, and then I'm just going to skip ahead because this is giving more back and back and back. So this gives well, a little bit of the, hmm. It's, it, it's a good thing that he doesn't live in the uh, Southern District of New York. because <laughs> Right, they would just file a suit against him. Right, exactly. Or these guys, he could hit these guys with a uh, libel. Um, although uh, although um, raising money on the internet probably does involve the FTC. And so if you, if you had... Um, uh, if you used this as the genesis for launching an FTC investigation into Tim Pool, uh, then that would be the purpose for uh, doing a hit piece like this. As absurd as it is, but does Betsy, does Betsy have an Instagram one? She will now. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get okay. there. Somebody should start it who's listening to this podcast right now. Just wait till we get to the end of the article. Okay. Anyway, so they give a little bit of the backstory. They raised a bunch of money. It was supposed to be a, a decentralized news network, and he was promoting the hell out of it on his videos. It was called Subverse. And That's right. he built a whole Minds channel for it and everything like that. So this lit Molly, who's saying her cat, Betsy, was the one that got taken. She was their chief content officer, and she was billed as their queen of content. Uh, then in May in 2020, Poole brought in Rocco Castoro, a former vice editor in chief who once journeyed to Guatemala to meet with fugitive cybersecurity baron John McAfee. Why that's relevant to this story, I don't know, except to cast dispersions. Like, oh, he was kind of a nut. He went and interviewed McAfee. Anyway, so he was brought in to run the site's editorial and business operations. Then their name was changed to Scanner. Who cares? Okay. So this is. Oh, no, but there's an implication that. There's an implication there. When you change the, sometimes when you change the name of a company, it's because you're rearranging uh, the chairs on the deck and different people have different um, stock allocations. And so it's kind of a common thing. If you, if you own a company and you have a majority of stock and you've made a deal with one person and that deal doesn't seem to be working out, you just close the company down, transfer the assets to another company. Um, and then you have new allocations of stock. So when I read that, I thought, oh, okay, he's he may be doing. And again, if you're the FTC and you're looking at this, that might be a clue that you're that Will Summer is throwing because he's trying to get someone to go investigate that. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. So Castro and Molly imbued this new scanner site with trash talking pirate ethos of early vice. In a November update to their backers, the pair promised to, quote, yank what you thought you knew straight out of your nose like Tutankhamun's brain, which sounds totally lame to me. Well, it's way older than Boomer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they told backers unhappy with the lack of new YouTube videos. Remember, this is the queen of content here that's not producing any videos. YouTube sucks a fat one. This is what they're saying to people that are giving them money and backing them like this is total total uh amateur hour stuff and i don't believe it because he doesn't cite where he gets this information from this is i feel like this is the two of them feeding this to will what i noticed is there's no there's none of this is backed up it's not like here are the emails or here's the text message threads nothing it's just no 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 citations around. correct yeah well they mentioned that that like this doesn't even tell you where that was but some, later we get to text messages. There's no screen caps. So um, YouTube sucks a fat one and advise them not to complain directly through the crowdfunding site like a ding dong. And so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> they hired um, someone from the silent generation to write this copy. So in response to questions about why Poole appeared to have a diminished role in the site, Castro and Molly told Poole's fans to email their quote, glorious leader say a little prayer, maybe he'll see it, they wrote. So again, where is the email for this? 
Okay. As she traveled the country last year with Castoro to produce videos for S or Scanner, Molly put her cat in the care of Ian Crossland, one of the co-hosts of Pool's podcast. Oh, so yeah. this isn't Pool. Right. <laughs> this is <laughs> co-host. <laughs> right. Right. He eventually joined a rotating cast of Pool Associates living in the Maryland mansion that Pool had purchased in 2020, bringing the cat with him. So he didn't even live at the mansion when he was given the cat. Right. And, <laughs> like this is... and I love the, I love the uh, magical illusion of Marilyn Mansion. It's like <laughs> Marilyn Manson, right? It's like he's got a little he's there's a little hocus pocus going on there. Correct. And I'm guessing that Will Summer probably lives in some studio apartment either in DC or New York. So du anything DuPont Circle. Yeah, know. anything larger than 1500 square feet would seem like a mansion to him. Well, I know multimillionaires who live in DuPont Circle who live in 900 square feet places. So, which is just insane. Mm -hmm. And people probably think that's a mansion comparatively. Yeah, I, I, the word mansion just cracks me up. You know, in Los Angeles, we have these things called Mick Mansions. Mm -hmm. We have those people, here. Yeah, because people need to maximize the amount of square footage they've got on the overpriced lot that they bought. So they get rid of the yard and they just build it corner to corner house up and down. Oh, is that what you guys call McMansions? Yeah. What do you oh. call McMansions? The neighborhoods where every house looks the same. Uh, no, here, like I live in the Pacific Palisades, as people know, ad nauseum. And uh, there's lots of lots that had little grandma houses on them. So they had little like 900 square foot, two bedroom, one bathroom houses that were built in the 1930s. And um, the real estate is so expensive that what somebody will do is that they'll buy one of those for $2 million dollars. Uh, and uh, knock the house down and then build a double basement, a, a, a house with a double basement uh, that goes up uh, two stories. So basically a four-story house that's two stories above the ground um, that ends on the, it's almost like a brownstone in New York. Um, there's, there, there's actually walkways usually because I think that you have to have three feet or something from the property line in the, in the, city code here, but they're basically, they, it looks like a uh, monopoly board houses, you know, they just take up the whole space. Anyway, I digress. That's all right. I did a nested loop without a set, without a uh, suggestion at the end. Yes. Yeah, so we'll have to come back to what nested loops mean after we get through this. So tensions between pool and his other partners flared this fall over who had access to various internal systems connected to Subverse. So this is when Castoro and, and Molly took the unusual step of investigating Poole themselves. With Ooh. Castro claiming he found evidence that Poole was involved in unsavory internet schemes. Unsavory. Right. <laughs> and the next sentence is uh, just, the Daily is, Beast is, was is unable. Sweet, is sweet and sour unsavory? Like yes. <laughs> Well, I think of unsavory agents, which is Sabo's brand, right? That, that's right. Unsavory agents. That's right. Uh, the Daily Beast was unable to independently confirm his allegations, but they repeat them without even a thought. And Poole declined to comment on all allegations made by Castro and Molly that didn't relate to the cat. So we, we can't <laughs> confirm this and Tim Poole won't comment. So right. we're just saying them anyway. Because he's citing ongoing legal issues. Okay, that fall and winter, a number of far-right figures appeared at Poole's Maryland mansion to appear on his internet show. And I love that they say they just appeared there as if by magic. They just teleported to his thing to appear on his internet show. You mean his, his interview podcast where they have guests? Because he also had lefties on there too. But we got to yep. go, nope, far-right. As Donald Trump fought his election defeat... So this is all going on and he's bringing in these crazy right wingers during the election thing. And from the very beginning of that on, on November the 4th and 5th, he was like, okay, guys, this is over. It's done. Give it up. So they included. In actually, actually he didn't. What he said is that there's a, I think that he quite often said there's a 99.9% .9 chance that this isn't going to go the way that these people think it's going to go. Right. So, so he actually kind of did the same thing that that we've been doing, which is that he's he left a little percentage of doubt out there for what was going on. And I think that that's astute. I mean, I think that that's a smart way to do it um, be, because 
in this kind of uh, post fact era that we live in, uh, that's the only thing that you can do. If you don't really actually know what's going on, then everything's a guess, right? So continue. Correct. So these uh, far right figures that appeared there, Peter, they included Infowars conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, who helped fund the pro Trump rally that preceded the January 6th riot. So did he? Did he? Look, I, I was involved in Stop the Steal, and Alex was there. I was with Alex on the 6th at the end, um, and he was there with his security guys, and he was supposed to be a speaker. So, you know, maybe he kicked some money in for security or something, but uh, I don't I don't remember him being intimately involved in it. Maybe he was. Uh, that was a claim that was made somewhere else that Alex had paid for some security or something. And maybe the stage that was at the Capitol. Right. You know, the speeches were supposed to take place and never did. Right. OK, well, that, that <laughs> I again, know <laughs> it's, again, it's a complete mischaracterization, but keep, Correct. keep going. <laughs> And Proud Boys chairman Enrique Tario, he had on your friend Enrique too. How dare he? Well, Will has done several hit pieces on the. He, everything is always uh, everything. Universal quantifier. Stop, Peter. <laughs> um, uh, Enrique Tario uh, and the Proud Boys are a, a constant uh, Will Summer subject. He he loves to bring them in and to paint them as this kind of radical basically he wants them to be the sa the brown shirts uh in of the of 1930s germany and uh if you've ever been to a proud boys meeting which i have a couple of times it is just the complete opposite <laughs> it's 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 yeah. a guy it's a bunch of guys drinking too much beer and punching each other while they name breakfast cereals and that's you're not being hyperbolic no, that's the initiation, right? <laughs> I mean, I one of the things I talked to Enrique about, and he'll confirm this if you asked him, is that I thought that they made a joke out of initiation uh, to the point where they could get infiltrated by bad actors and because uh, they weren't looking for them because they were treating the whole thing as a joke. And that seems to have come come to come to be. So there it is. And so Tario is now facing felony charges for unlicensed possession of a gun magazine in Washington, D.C., ahead of the riot. So we're just going to throw that in there so we can get some guilt by association going on. And I don't understand. He, he was just running around with a magazine? It seems so odd to me. I saw the pictures of the magazines. He, there were two AR-15 magazines that were empty that had Proud Boy... Uh, uh, logos or something on them, um, which just seemed really odd to me. Um, it, it, it seemed like a setup uh, in some way because uh, having, I, well, first of all, like as far as firearms are concerned, I, I, I'm very, I'm anti LARPing, meaning I think that putting two A stickers on your cars or going around with Moan Abe, Abe is that what it is? Yeah, Mola uh, Mabe, come and uh, grab it, come and take uh, it. Yeah, T-shirts and all, the, those are all provoca prov provocations, right? And I think that the best weapon to have is the one that nobody knows you've got. And so going around, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, positioning yourself and putting your name on firearms and doing all of that other stuff is like counter uh, productive. So, uh, when I saw that stuff, I, I just thought, well, that's kind of dumb, like in in any case. Um, and it, and I don't know what's true because it hasn't come. It, it hasn't gone to trial yet. And I haven't talked to Enrique about it. But, right. But I mean, just on its face, what's the point of carrying around a magazine? Uh, without, uh, without a weapon, a magazine with the name of your organization on it that can uh, whose only useful purpose is LARPing or used being used as evidence. Yeah, so it could I mean to me it sounds like something that was a setup. Yeah, like something that was put into his luggage. Or if somebody came up to him and was like, "Dude, I made these for you. Check it out." That yeah, that that's yeah, exactly. Somebody somebody who had named uh, enough breakfast cer cereals to get into the proud boy. <laughs> right, right. Right. 
<laughs> okay, so Castoro began posting cryptically about his investigations into Pool on Twitter, taunting Pool. See, there's no tweet here, though. There's not even a quote of what was tweeted. It's bizarre. Did this actually happen? I don't know. So taunting Pool, who was ostensibly still his business partner. The fight between the three of them climaxed on January the 6th as Molly prepared to cover protests outside of the Capitol. I, have you ever run into her in the field? I've never heard of this woman before. I, I Well, first of all, there were people at, there on January 6th that I know that I didn't see because there were so many people there. Sure. Uh, including George Webb, who does stick out in a crowd. Um, and uh, uh, I have seen her. And frankly, I was always, I, she was always a giant question mark for me okay. whenever, because I subscribed to all of Tim's channels. So every once in a while, she would, a video would come up on my YouTube stream that would have her in it and she would be covering some stream. And there's an old, this is again, another boomer reference, but there's this old episode of the, of the Flintstones where Wilma Flintstone is auditioning to be an actress. And her audition line is Bill did you take the baby's college fund money? <laughs> and, and uh, uh, you know, her delivery was so terrible that it was funny. And whenever I used to watch Molly, I used to think of Wil Wil Wilma Flintstone because uh, she may, had, may have had good information, but her delivery was just not great. You know, it wasn't, uh, and she may might have been a great researcher and she might have been good at, um, uh, uh, finding stuff, but you know, the questions that went on in my head whenever I was watching her is, is this Tim's girlfriend? Is this Tim's sister? Like is why this kind of a political hire? You mean? Like, yeah. Like yeah. why, why is she, why is she on this channel? What is, what it is it that, what purpose, what hole is she filling uh, for, for, uh, for Tim uh, that he needs to have filled? Cause um, it just seemed to be filler. And I almost never watched her videos because they put me to sleep. Yeah, Dave Hangland is saying she was the uh, regular announcer over on Subverse. Yeah. See, I never watched any of those. And uh, Infidel Apostate says he thought Enrique was just delivering the mags to another Proud Boy member who had requested or purchased them or something. Right. And to Tracy's uh, point, that sounds like a setup. Yeah. Hey, can you drop these things off for me? Oops, you, you're, you're, you arrest, you're caught at the airport point? and you're arrested. Right. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like... Uh, uh, and. Uh, if Andy McCabe was still involved with the FBI, I would think, oh, that sounds like an Andy McCabe operation. Um, Discord is garbage. Yes, and it seems that you weren't the only one. Yep. So this uh, kind of, if, if, if what you guys are saying is true, maybe this was some kind of a charity case. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. Because we've all been involved. In, I mean, I have. I mean, we had an editor at Got News that was definitely a charity case and that wound up costing us the entire business. So it happens. Yep. So and it continues as Molly filmed the protest that would soon culminate in a riot. This is the second time he's referred to the events on the six as a riot. The first one's up here. Uh, Castoro in Los Angeles. Castoro in Los Angeles and increasingly alienated from Poole tweeted a cryptic message he now claims would prove that he was aware of some of Poole's schemes. So increasing, <laughs> increasingly alienated. What was mm -hmm. the what was the next word? Increasingly and at, oh tweeted a cryptic message. Yes, and he, he in, says in, and cryptic message indicating that there's some secret meaning, right, in the message. Uh, yeah that he claims, so it's questionable whether or not that's true. He claims that it would prove, if it was a real thing, that he was aware of some scheme of pools. I mean, what a twisted, <laughs> I know. logical like, pretzel that how sentence How does this get past an editor? Uh, well, it's a it's it's a it's CIA product placement. <laughs> they should be embarrassed, though. This is a defective product. There's funding attached to this post. I'm telling you. 
I, I, I don't th- disagree with there's you. Bi- there's Bitcoin moving. <laughs> you should check your whale alert. Although I don't think it would. They just give him a, like, a, I don't know, a Satoshi of Bitcoin and he'd jump on it. Well, they give him a few Satoshis, but yeah. Yeah. So it's difficult to discern the meaning of Castoro's tweet, which he still won't show to us, which consists of screenshots of IP logs and domain names. Ooh. I know. Still, the tweet set off pool. No, it's interesting because George Webb occasionally would post IP numbers with domain names and uh, and was, uh, I, I would say, he would, he, would, he would push back about identifying where those things came from um, and, and what they actually meant. Um, and it was almost like a shot over the bow to somebody who actually was maintaining those servers or something. So I, I, I don't un- exactly understand the strategy, but it's, it's odd inside baseball kind of stuff. Yes. But still, the tweet set off Pool, who could apparently understand exactly what Castro meant. Apparently and understand, who could apparently understand that is another tortured sentence. Right. He could apparently understand it. Well, does he understand or does <laughs> not apparent? Like, how would you know if he it wasn't apparent? Well, like, I mean, right. I mean, you could you you could write an NLP doctoral dissertation on this uh, article. Maybe we should. And I love this is the article that they shove in the middle of it that they want you to read. So just furthering that, a right, far right wing militia member doing security for Trump allies. Yeah, and then it, it says connections. It's like if, so if, in if your you are, face. If you are my neighbor, the one that with the resist sticker on her business on her on her car, she she would just suck all this stuff up like a vacuum cleaner. Of be, course she would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I meant to delete. I meant to um, get rid of all swear words, but they said Rocco is posting insane shit and private details. Poole wrote in a text message to Molly, where is the text message? I, I, I don't understand. She's talking to them. Right. She's quoted in this, and so is Castaro, but they don't share any of these things. So I'm calling BS. As the riot, again, began, Poole demanded in a voicemail that, Mo- that, quote, Molly return to his home in Maryland immediately. So this is supposedly the text messages, which, again, we don't have screen grabs for. So remember, we're being promised that he demanded in a voicemail that she return to his home. Here we go. You need to call me back right now. A person whose voice closely resembles Pools <laughs> said in the message. Well, like, why can't I'm sorry. Why don't we have audio of this? And, yeah, uh, and I need you to call me back right now. Sounds like a business directive. Yeah. Not, like I'm your boss. Okay, we're running a journalistic operation here. I need to talk to you about what's going on right now. Um, Correct. <laughs> you, I mean, yeah, you could frame that as a demand, but it also sounds like management. Well, and it's also interesting to me because they're saying that as she filmed the protest, it would soon culminate in a riot. So this is before stuff broke out, I suppose. But it would be interesting to see, why don't you share the timeline with us, Will? Because what is this before or after stuff started getting really crazy? Well, because he's going to reveal his sources, who seems to be Molly and Castoro. Right. Right. So you need to call me back right now. A person whose voice closely resembles Poole said in the message, which was shared with the Daily Beast. I don't know what you did, but this is beyond serious. Poole continued without naming exactly what he was angry about. See, there's no, so all of a did sudden she he's go, angry. Did she, did she go in the Capitol? <laughs> maybe maybe you know I, if i was if i was tim pool and my uh camera people went inside the Capitol, putting my entire business at risk i might be animated about it but remember know. this is supposed to be related to these tweets or the yeah his his cryptic tweeting rocco's okay so okay um, I don't know what's going on other than what the F did you do? Poole said, you need to call me back. This one's on you. Whatever ends up happening, I had nothing to do with it. So again, this is the entirety of this. Where is his demand that she come home? Did she come to his house? It's nowhere in there. And by the way, this is all leading up to the cat napping. Correct. This is supposedly all about the cat. <laughs> 
Asked to explain the voicemail, Poole wrote in an email to the Daily Beast that it, quote, pertains to an internal corporate legal dispute. So much more information on this will be made public in the coming weeks, Poole told the Daily Beast. So in a labor complaint, again, still no cat. Uh, filed in Los Angeles, Castoro alleges that Poole, quote, made irrational and angry threats and demands. And you'll notice that in this phone conversation, he just says he was angry, but he didn't say he was yelling or anything like this. So that's all by insinuation. Demanding that Molly give him the footage Molly shot of the riot. Castro told the Daily Beast that Molly shot footage during the riot of several Poole associates, including Jones. And now this is where I turn to you, Peter, because you were with him during the riot. I was. Did you happen to notice Molly around? Well, I, I was with him during the non riots. Okay. Because all of the places where Alex Jones was on the 6th, there weren't riots. There were people who were coming back to Alex. I have pictures of them reporting to Alex uh, that uh, there were agent provocateurs that were intermingled with the MAGA people that were breaking windows and uh, breaking into the doors and doing all kinds of untoward things, at which point Alex Jones, uh, together with Ali Alexander and their secure their large security teams, uh, decided that it was a setup and that uh, if they stayed there any longer, that they were going to be uh, implicated in organizing uh, the bad things that were happening, which they had nothing to do with, and uh, and they left. Um, so. You know, the, the Alex, at one point, I think he got up on top of a scissors lift with a with a, a megaphone. And I think there's lots of video of that. And uh, uh, he was yelling at the Congress. But there was there there was a group of people that was not Alex Jones that were standing on top of a truck that were encouraging people on the Supreme Court side of the Capitol to go up the stairs and to storm through the doors. I did go to the top of the stairs once the. Once the stairs were completely filled with protesters and the patio at the top was there um, and uh, and it seemed to have settled down, I went up there and I took pictures. I went up, turned around, took a picture of the pictures of the crowd and came back. I did go up to the doors. I was not going to go in ever. And uh, but I didn't there was no riot on on that side. There was a lot of there was a lot of people yelling um, and there was a lot of uh, chanting. But. Uh, I, I I can't imagine what video uh, of a, that had Alex Jones in it that would have been a problem. But, right. Well, this is just all speculation. Yeah. That um, we can only assume, speaking of speculation, he did not want something specifically that was happening at the Capitol to be filmed by Emily that day, Historo writes in the labor complaint. What a bunch of hoo-ha. Yeah, honestly, like, how would he know if he hasn't seen the footage? How would he know unless she said, oh, I captured X, Y, Z. But you we're supposed to believe that he would spike good footage. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, running back to the the original Andrew Breitbart uh, uh, black congressional caucus gambit that Andrew uh, did 10 years ago where he offered uh, a ten thousand dollar reward and then uh upped it to a hundred thousand dollar reward for anybody that could prove uh, with video or audio evidence that, uh, that John uh, the Mason Lewis, John Lewis uh, was spit on or called the N word. Um, at which point Andrew Breitbart wrote a check for zero because nobody ever came up with it. So the, the, uh, the, the, the absurdity of this thing is that the, I believe that what happened on January 6th will go down in history as the most recorded event in world history. There, there were hundreds of thousands of people with iPhones and smartphones shooting video and taking pictures, live streaming and texting the thing in real time. So the idea that any individual I mean that one piece of footage where the where the cop shot Ashley um, Babbitt. Babbitt. Um, yeah, that was a unique that was a unique point of view, and that you could have only gotten in gotten that footage if you went inside and you were in lead of, in lead, leading the pack and 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 in there. But um, so to that extent, I mean, 
was she standing next to what was that guy's name? John Sullivan. Sullivan. Was she standing next to John Sullivan? Did she have another angle? Is that what they're talking about? Because the only thing that I could assume uh, uh, th is that there's some unique special footage that only that person would have. And the odds, the odds of anybody being that person um, are based on boldness and, and uh, luck at a certain point. So who knows? Who knows what she had? Right. She to your point, if she was standing next to John Sullivan, she could have cashed out too. He made 70 grand off of that video, did he not? Yep. Yeah. So if there was anything worthwhile on this footage, then it would have already seen the light of day by this point. Because these two don't sound like <laughs> they have any integrity. So I don't know why they wouldn't have sold it off if there was something to it. Yep. And we still haven't gotten to the cat. Right. No, I know. That's what Dave pointed out. <laughs> Can we just get back to the damn cat? So that same day, the day of the riots, Poole removed Castoro and, and Molly's access to the Scanner YouTube channel. Uh, a day later, Poole officially fired Castoro and Molly, setting off a dispute over who controls what's left of Scanner and who has equity in the company. Poole continued to ask Molly to visit his remote Maryland mansion, according to Molly. So she has nothing to back up this claim at all. She's just saying, oh, he was constantly telling me to come to his house. So she said, I wasn't going to go to his house because he was going to try to take my footage. And I pointed, only if you bring it with you. What, what kind of nonsense is that? Well, but I mean, I don't know what her deal was, but when you're a journalist and you're working for an outfit, um, if they're usually you have something called a work for hire agreement, which means that any product that you create does belong to your employer, unless she's, a, a string or a freelance, but it didn't. It doesn't didn't, sound she, like that. If she was part of the operation, then anything that she creates probably does belong to the entity. Yes, but he can only take it from her if she brings it with. Well, it's digital. She could just upload it to him. Right, but I'm saying she said she wouldn't go to his house because he was going to try to take it. So if I think somebody's going to steal something from me, I don't bring it with me if I go to meet with them. Right? I mean, it's that easily solved. Yeah. <laughs> this is such nonsense. So, like, that's the kind of question I would ask as a reporter. Wait, what if he just didn't bring it? Idiot. Okay. So, this is when I had a little fun. Oh, yeah. This whole article is supposed to be about a cat napping. <laughs> so, <laughs> the growing rift between Scanner's executives <laughs> was bad news for Betsy the cat, who was still living in Poole's Maryland mansion. Molly Cause, says Crossland. Because Betsy's all about the news. Yeah. It was Betsy. bad news for Betsy. <laughs> That's a good band name. <laughs> there you go. We'll make a t-shirt. Bad news for Betsy. <laughs> Who is still living in the mansion. That's a terrible thing, right? To have to live in this opulent mansion, often at the uh, Maryland backwoods or whatever. However. Right. There's no mice to catch. Or... <laughs> no. Molly says Crossland claimed to be unable to help her regain custody of her cat, providing text messages supposedly from Crossland that appear to show him suggesting that Poole, not he, has control over the cat's fate. Supposedly. Right. <laughs> I can't get involved with Betsy. And then I like that he uses a semicolon. Uh, you will have to run everything by Tim, Crossland allegedly wrote to Molly. She's in good hands until you take her, he says. So where's the screen grab? Like, I love that. Allegedly wrote to her. Did you see the text or did you not see the text? That's where the editor got involved. Oh, uh, okay. That sounds, sounds, sounds fair. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he cat. She's a cat grifter. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is also a good point. Maybe just Tim wanted her to come and get her damn cat. <laughs> right. Correct. <laughs> So Molly says she was reluctant to send anyone to Poole's mansion, which looms large in the imaginations of Poole's former partners. In a recording. Now, now, okay, yeah. so here's some hypnosis. So his mansion is looming large. Okay, so now you're getting this picture of this large. I want to see I want to see the I want to see the mansion. I know I do too. I just think it's probably some ranch house. With this poor little cat that's like, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, in a recording of a 2020 meeting obtained by the Daily Beast, again, where's the recording? Although I'm guessing this is all illegally obtained because I don't know which city they were in when this happened. If he was in Jersey, that might be illegal. If he was in Pennsylvania, it's definitely illegal. You're talking about two party state. I'm talking about two party states. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just um, for the just for the listeners, in certain states, uh, you're allowed to secretly record somebody's phone call or or voice message, and in other states, you're not. Yes. So there's one party consent states, which just means one party that's part of the conversation consents to recording it. So I could record Peter without telling him I was doing it, and that would be okay. Or since I'm in Pennsylvania and it's a two party that would take precedent. And I think California is a two party too. Isn't California it? is two party, which is why I got uh, YouTube and all those other people to remove all of those uh, Jason Goodman illegal recordings of me. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it worked for your benefit. Although it all goes out the window in a public setting where there's no expectation of privacy. Yeah, it does. Yes. Okay. So the large looming mansion <laughs> in a recording of a 2020 meeting obtained by the Daily Beast, Poole discusses owning multiple guns and abandoning urban life after living in New York City and deciding that he was, quote, getting the F out of cities after sensing the potential for unspecified escalation. Now, really unspecified escalation. Live, he's talked about it before on his lives on his show where he's like he lived in New York City until there was a murder outside of his house. And then he moved somewhere closer in the New York metro area. And then the riot started. So he moved again and he moved to South Jersey and the riots came over the bridge from New, from Philadelphia. So he said, get forget this. I'm getting out of these cities. It's just not a good place to be. Unspecified. I'm I'm interpreting as lazy journalist. <laughs> yeah, that could be. I couldn't find it, so I'm going to call it unspecified. No, it I'm just not, not going to acknowledge it. It would have required me knowing too much about what I'm writing about. Well, it would also have to be like he was scared because Black Lives Matter and Antifa were burning cities down all last summer. No, but I'm talking about Will Summer not knowing that or not understanding that and then chalking it up to the word unspecified. Sure, but okay, then that, Molly that, did that, say that's, that's just false. In fact, Tim is within his uh, rights to ask for a retraction on the use of the word unspecified. <laughs> there you go. So he's terrified of cities because he thinks Antifa is going to attack him. Molly told the Daily Beast, which isn't irrational. No, it's not. They they say terrible things about him all the time. Yeah, and he stopped going out to cover protests because he was yeah. getting attacked. Right. He saw what happened to Andy No, and he thought, you know what? I'm better off sitting in my house doing videos. Yeah, didn't he leave the country? Andy No? I thought he moved out of the States. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to fact check that. Can anybody uh, on the associate producer tip fact check that for me? I thought he moved. Uh, Poole disputed Molly's characterization, saying he's not concerned about Antifa. Yes, that's correct. E. Caddy was. I live in the D.C. area, the political hotspot, and I'm not worried about Antifa, Poole told the Daily Beast. And don't worry, we are going to get to Betsy. Molly was also reluctant to send anyone in her place to Poole's estate. And now it's become an estate, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't call it a compound. That would have been the way to go with all of this. I, he had his thesaurus open that day. <laughs> Tim freaks a, a lot of people out and telling people you have to go to Tim's compound. There we go. Yeah, he freaked Mike Cernovich out a couple weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Tim's compound in the middle of Maryland freaks people out. See, he's got a compound now. That makes you think of Waco, right? At the middle of Maryland. What a, what, <laughs> what does that even mean? And I'm like, who is afraid of Tim Pool? Who's afraid of Maryland? <laughs> the red part of the state. When Molly tried to, to get her cat back by sending Pool an email, again, where's the email? Offering to send people to pick him up at the house anyway and to pay for a veterinary visit. Well, first of all, he misgendered that cat, unless Betsy yeah. identifies as him. Uh, oh. And right, <laughs> I don't know. Ask Lauren Southern. <laughs> and uh, uh, to pay for a veterinary visit so the cat could be cleared to fly on an airplane. This is a fancy cat. It's leaving a compound and jet setting across the country. That's right. Cool. Then referred her to his lawyer. Quote: Any correspondence must go right. through our attorney. 
<laughs> Please contact them. <laughs> this was the funniest. This attorney's response was the funniest thing I read. It is. But Willie Stecklow, Stecklo, a lawyer who had been asked to untangle the fight over Scanner's future, told Molly he wasn't handling the increasingly elaborate cat exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I this did is... not represent any cat, as I do <laughs> not have the requisite experience to represent cats. <laughs> I think that guy sounds like a master troll. I really like him. <laughs> Can you imagine him getting this call from Will Summer? Like, will you talk about the cat dispute that's going on? <laughs> <It's> like, cat. <laughs> this is hard hitting journalism. And clients like cats come in all stripes. I mean, come on, this guy's totally screwing with them. Uh, Molly eventually called the sheriff's department because they have nothing better to do in Washington County, Maryland. Again, making sure everybody knows where Tim lives. Okay, yeah, let's 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 get the let's. We know it's Maryland. Now we know it's Washington County. Where is it? It's like Who's... we'll get we'll, we'll get uh, 4chan to go find the white flag. Right. We can you imagine being on the other end of this phone call. So the, while the case wasn't a straightforward <laughs> theft case because it's not theft. Uh, since Crossland had legally taken custody of the cat from Molly, Washington County Lieutenant uh, J uh, Joshua McCauley tried to settle the dispute. He talked to someone who identified himself as Poole in an attempt to get the cat back. Here's all this from the, this is all from the sheriff. And this sounds like <laughs> what actually happened. While the cat was there, communications with the parties broke down because of some ongoing criminal or civil manner between them. Macaulay told the Daily Beast, quote, Mr. Poole was reluctant to have any contact because of that. So he stated that he really wanted to give the cat back. He didn't want the cat, but he didn't really know how to do it without having contact. The sheriff's lieutenant recommended how, that. How, how reasonable is that? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, what's the, um, I kept thinking, this is a crazy cat chick. And what's that? disease that most people that have cats get that starts rotting your brain. Oh, it's a uh, uh, to toxoplasmosis. Yes. Toxoplasmosis. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's what I was from, thinking. from litter boxes. Right. <laughs> right. And, yes. and I, and I also wonder whether or not the, the daily beast editor uh, called up Will Summer and said, you know, cat stories are really popular on the internet. Can you do a cat story? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and he saw this and he just leapt at it. Right. <laughs> Like, like, like catnip. It was like, oh, look, a cat story. I'm going to write it. Oh, man. Catnip, it's got the Proud Boys and the alt right and everything else. It's going to be great. <laughs> oh, man. The sheriff's lieutenant recommended that Poole drop the cat in an animal shelter where one of Molly's friends could pick him up in an arrangement that would prevent the cat from entering the shelter's general adoption system or being put down. After a few days, the exchange took place and one of Molly's friends flew the cat to Los Angeles. And they wrote, how fancy. This cat, this cat has had a better 2021 20, or whenever this happened than any of us. Pool and I bet you cats don't have to wear masks on planes, huh? Nope. Bastards. I'm going to identify as a cat. Uh, the cat was never transferred to me. Emily left it with Ian. And she was talking with him, Poole wrote in an email to the Daily Beast. So we, again, I don't know why he's not just showing me the email. The sheriff asked about Ian returning the cat, and that was it. So that could be the whole story about the damn cat. But yet we've gone on. So her friends, this is what crazy cat ladies do. No offense to anyone who's a crazy cat lady. Molly's friends celebrated the cat safe return by releasing a video under the banner, The Bobo, a play on real animal news website, The Dodo. In place of the extinct bird, the bogus site's logo featured a rat wearing Poole's trademark gray beanie. This is... So I don't know if Betsy's got an Instagram yet, but she's on her way. She's on a YouTube video. So the fight over a scanner remains unsolved with the pros unresolved with the prospect of future conflict between its executives looming, just like that mansion looms large. On a Tuesday, Cat Castoro claimed yet again he has new proof of, po of Poole's perfidity. It's not clear who actually owns the site. For the Perfi cat, the perfidy. Perfidy? I don't even perfidy, know what that I means. Think. Is that supposed to be some somebody? Kind of cat thing? Some, somebody in the chat will tell us what perfidy means. I think mm -hmm. that I think it's a um, epithet, though, or it's an implied epithet. Okay. Keep going, well, and I'll, I'll find out what. It okay. Means. For the cat, though, the saga is over. 
She's happy, Millie said. How do we know? Did the cat tweet that? <laughs> it's, uh, the cat posted on its Instagram. Oh, perfidy. The definition is the quality or state of being faithless or disloyal. Tre treachery. Interesting. It's a very good word, though, because you think of perfidy yeah. and cats. Oh, Tracy. So that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> or so, is it? Well, I mean, it's 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 fairly anticlimactic, right? Like the set the setup it, it's almost like it's like what i just said it's like you're going to use a cat terrorism a story about terrorizing a cat a poor helpless animal in order to dump all of this information and leak it out in a way that um you can point to some f uh tc uh investigator saying oh i saw this article in the daily beast so i need to go investigate Tim Pool, because he because he did raise a million dollars. So there's uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but one of the outgrowths of crowdfunding has been this idea that you can float uh, the equivalent of something like an IPO uh, using crowdfunding. It's got to be completely dialed in with the Federal Trade Commission, uh, and it has to meet all of these specific uh, uh, qualifications in order to be able to do that. But that is what Tim Pool did. So he raised a uh, million dollars in order to build his own uh, journalism outlet. Um, and to the extent that uh, what uh, Summer is talking about here indicates that there might be some shenanigans, um, uh, I have no doubt that there is some FTC investigator that is now gonna go and knock on Tim's door and find out what's going on, ask to look at his records. Uh, because that's the purpose of this story. It's not really about uh, a cat. It's about uh, alerting the FTC that they, in a weaponized uh, state, uh, that you need to go uh, take a look at this stuff. Um, or is this all an elaborate plank that's being played by Tim? Yeah, and that was your other uh, <laughs> hypothesis. I'd like you to go into that a little bit because it's it, it made me, I, I've noticed uh, since we've been doing this, uh, this uh, live stream that my face is hurting because I'm smiling too hard, but <laughs> um, so tell me about your hypothesis. So that article came out the morning of March the 11th at 5.01 AM. This is the episode of TRL that aired that night, March 11th. And it starts with Tim playing with a cat, which I've never seen before. And he made some discussion about the cat. So see, there's the cat and he calls the cat the boss and all this kind of stuff. And they're totally joking about the cat. And I didn't understand why, because I hadn't seen that piece yet. So when we were doing prep for this, that, that occurred to me. I was like, wait a minute, what day was it that he had the stupid cat sitting in front of him on the table before the show started? And I put it together and I thought, huh, because he's also been talking about how he's playing around and trying to basically break Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. You, go, tell me about that. <laughs> so he said for the longest time, there was a story. It was up there for, I think he fought with them for about seven years to get this thing removed from his personal Wikipedia page where it said Tim Pool invented a, um, they didn't call it a blimp, but like an aerial camera thing. And he's like, no, that never happened. One of my friends and I, we hacked a commercial drone so that we could do live feeds from it. And they used that to stream Occupy Wall Street back in the day. But this somehow makes it into some, you know, Wikipedia trusted source and it gets published on his Wikipedia page. And he said he came to learn that it doesn't matter if the Wikipedia page is Tim Pool's Wikipedia page and Tim Pool reaches out and says, hey, this isn't something that I did. They will point to you, they will point to the article that says you did it and say, no, we believe that and not you. Yeah. And that's that leads, you know, I I'll, I'll put on my tinfoil hat and 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 say that my assumption uh, for probably over a year now has been that the inception of Wikipedia was uh, a public, was a disinformation campaign. That is by establishing itself as an authority and creating this mythos that uh, it's all of these uh, uh, open source editors out there in the world who are managing all of this stuff uh, that you can, that you can trust it as a source. But what we've, all come to find is that uh, there's certain information that is uh, 
is, is as solid as concrete on Wikipedia and you cannot change it. They won't let you change it. And um, I actually had a Twitter, uh, uh, Jimmy Wales actually had a partner who has a open information platform that he's been uh, promoting. I can't remember his name. Maybe somebody in the chat room knows, will remember for me. But uh, uh, I, I posited one day that, uh, that w was the original source of information for Wikipedia, something like the CIA fact book that just got ported over, you know, cause you, you need to start someplace, right. In order to populate a database like that with something. Um, and it occurred to me that, oh yeah, the CIA fact book, probably world world fact book probably sounds like a good place to start. And, um, the Jimmy Wales co-founder re replied to me in Twitter that, um, um, that uh, there was no way of, he said it was a good hypothesis, but there was no way of knowing because the way that Wikipedia was originally set up is that you could be an anonymous editor and nobody would know who you were. And he said that was part of the design. And he realizes now that it was a, a complete flaw in a vector uh, because it's been weaponized and used against people. So I've gone off in a nested loop. <laughs> No, but that was why, I mean, it was related to all of this. We've talked about Wikipedia here before yeah. and just how nefarious the whole damn thing is. The fact that you can't even get your own page corrected about yourself. Well, and, I, you know, and I was trying to troll Wikipedia. So your, your contention, just to finish that thought, is that Tim Pool is trolling Wikipedia. Explain, that, explain how that works. So he's trolling Wikipedia by trying to bait journalists into writing stories about him, journalists from quote unquote trusted sources that Wikipedia will then link to and to say that he has said whatever it is. So he started doing that with his Twitter feed and he tweeted out maybe oh, last week or the week before. Uh, I think it was this week because it was in the wake of the Harry and Meghan interview on Oprah that everybody talked about for days. He tweeted impeach the queen. And <laughs> some journalists took him seriously and wrote a piece about it. So now that can go up on his Wikipedia page. Right. Saying, Tim Pool called for the impeachment of, the, of Queen Elizabeth II. And he's like, this is so absurd and stupid. Like, I know that it's it's not a possibility, but I do it to like get a rise out of people. He's come under the tutelage of Michael Malice, who's one of the best um, tweeters out there because you can't tell which side of whatever he's saying he believes. Yep, infidel yeah. or but. Uh, Postate says, I swear H.G. Wells foretold Wikipedia in the world brain in 1930. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's look, you you establish this thing as the as the go to source for anybody who's looking anything up and then you use it in order to stigmatize only certain subjects. Um, uh, and you don't and there's no recourse. It's kind of like dealing. It's actually worse than dealing with the tech giants, because at least if Twitter is doing something to you, you know, Twitter is doing it. You know, it's somebody at Twitter is doing it. But when the mysterious Wikipedia editors decide that they do or don't like something that you're doing. So, for example, here's something that I did. I, I, I've trolled Wikipedia a couple of times. Um, when I took some really good pictures of George Zimmerman probably I don't know, four or five years ago. And um, every story about George Zimmerman was a picture that they pulled off of Wikipedia that was his mugshot. Like he's got an orange, I think he's got an orange shirt on and like, you know, he's overweight and he's tired and it's a terrible picture of him. I took, I took a really good pic. I took lots of really good pictures of him. And I said, why don't we take one of these pictures and uh, I'll make it uh, in order for it to show up on Wikipedia, you have to put it into the public domain. That is, you have to relinquish your copyright to the image and let it go. And so I took one of, not one of the best pictures, but a good picture of George. And I posted it up into the Wikimedia Commons and I made it part of the public domain and then I attached it to his Wikipedia page. Um, and it was up there for a day uh, uh, and it got taken down. And the, uh, at first it got taken down because they said that uh, no photographer would give up the rights to a photograph that was that high quality. And I said, well, I'm the photographer. And uh, and then they, uh, I had to jump through some hoops with the Wikimedia Commons in order to uh, prove that I was relinquishing my rights. And so I went through that and I did that and I attached it to the George Zimmerman page. And 
boom, it was gone and they won't allow it to be linked to the page. You can find it if you go to the Wikimedia Commons, but if you go to George Zimmerman's Wikipedia page, uh, you can't find that picture linked on the Wikipedia page. They don't want a good picture of George Zimmerman. And so Enrique Terrio and I actually went through the same exercise about uh, three or four months ago. Um, and uh, I, I do believe uh, that the same thing happened, that the picture that I took, which is a world-class you know, magazine quality photograph, uh, regardless of what the trolls at the New York Times Magazine may say, um, that uh, that picture appeared on his Wikipedia page for a day or two, and then boom, it was unlinked, and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. So uh, for for the record, I have relinquished all of my rights to one single picture of George Zimmerman that's a good picture, and one single picture of Enrique Terrio that's a, it's actually a great picture. Yeah, we've shared it on here before. Yeah. So anyway, um, all that's to say that this could just be an elaborate prank by Tim to get a reporter at a site that I assume is allowed to be cited on Wikipedia to write a post about him being a catnapper. Yeah. So that will go on his bio because he wants his Wikipedia bio to be so absurd and so disassociated from who he really is that it becomes a parody. So he's he's basically pulling a Sam Hyde. Yes, right. exactly. And for people who don't know who Sam Hyde is, he's a comedian um, that has decided to troll the internet by uh, uh, leaking photographs of himself every time there's like a, uh, a, a mass shooting or some kind of terrorist event. Uh, very quickly within uh, four or five minutes of that news breaking, there will always be a picture of the perpetrator and it's always Sam Hyde. It's always, it's always. Yes, he, he was a, he's a master troll. His fake Ted talk is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> you just go search for Sam Hyde and it's a, a H Y D E. Yeah. It, and talk. It's, yeah. And it's part of our video when we opened this morning. Yes. Here's, here's, here's the crazy ones. So Sam <laughs> Hyde wearing, wearing Roman armor and it's a Tim plastic pool, <laughs> and, and a Tim pool style beanie. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Well, here's a question. Do you, I don't know the answer to this. Do you, Peter, what sources has Wikipedia shadow banned? Um, it's, it's not that they shadow ban things. It's that they freeze disinformation. That and is. They also don't consider sources credible. Like, I don't think you could put a Breitbart link up there. You couldn't put a gateway pundit link as a um, citation. I guess it depends on how the citation is being applied. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're like, uh, all of those fact checking websites and things like that. It's completely political, uh, unperson Judith Very Baker and Joseph P. Farrell. Yep. Uh, and they deleted their pages entirely as opposed to just calling them conspiracy theorists. Cause I think that if you look up Kathy O'Brien, uh, I think in the first five words, it's conspiracy theorist, Kathy O'Brien. I would guess that that's um, what Alex Jones's page says too. But with somebody like Alex that's that high profile, you couldn't really not have a page for him. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, it, it gets fairly insidious. I um, So I'm a big fan of uh, Kurt Vonnegut. And uh, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about uh, the book and the movie Cat's Cradle uh, the other day. And Cat's Cradle, for, I'm sorry, not Cat's Cradle, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. And uh, for people who... I uh, don't know the story. Slaughterhouse-Five is a story about this guy, Billy Pilgrim, who gets abducted by aliens, uh, Tralfamadorians, that are unstuck in that cause him to become unstuck in time. And so he describes his life as a human being that has become unstuck in time, like a Tralfamadorian. Uh, I've read the book four or five times. I've watched the movie several times. And I thought, well, I could probably find a video on YouTube that would explain the video, the, the story to my friend in a way that is, is uh, more succinct than I could. And I went and I found this video and the entire conceit of the video explaining the book Slaughterhouse-Five is that it's the story of a guy who's having a psychotic break. And the whole idea of, of uh, fiction to me is to suspend disbelief, right? That the guy's not having a psychotic break. He's really seeing aliens and this is what's really happening to his life. It's like describing, you know, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings as a psychotic break, you know, because the characters are seeing lightsabers or something. It's like, 
what planet are you on? Like, <laughs> and, and this is an authoritative source. And so I was like, I was dumbfounded. I was dumbfounded by the entire. Um, oh, maybe that's uh, the modern interpretation. He was suffering PTSD, Peter. You know, it was Vonnegut channeling his own PTSD from being in the war. And this is how he was dealing with it. Right. Well, I, can, I can see that interpretation of that book. I don't yeah. think it's, I don't agree with it. Right. But. right. And, I, and I don't disagree that that could be an interpretation. And if you were explaining the book to somebody, you would say, well, some people might think this is a psychotic break. And some people might think that this is uh, just uh, uh, creative fiction. Um, but to characterize it as a psychotic break, I thought was, was, uh, not fair to Vonnegut or the storytelling. Yeah. See, this is why I think you could, you could look at it and say it's more PTSD than a psychotic break where your PTSD is that your brain hasn't properly processed what happened to you. So it keeps bringing it back up, hoping that it'll get through the processing centers is at least my understanding. Right. So that would be like an Alfred Appel kind of style analysis. He wrote the annotated Lolita where he assuaged, he attached psychological references to uh, uh, the processes that Nabokov was going through when he wrote the book. Um, it's rather more heroic than psychosis. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if that's the process that you use to get over it uh, and you can make a lot of money doing it at the same time and become a celebrity, you know, more power to you. Sure. All right, well, let's get to questions because we're going to wrap up a little bit early today. So this was a question that was sitting there. Do I? Do you think Tim Pool and others' culture war headline buffet style of punditry is effective? Uh, yes. Uh, and the measure that I would use is uh, audience and traffic and revenue. Um, uh, I, I make a joke of it. I, you know, I've talked to George Webb about this a lot, but that Tim Pool makes five minute videos that are 20 minutes long. Um, and that's because he's so dialed in as far as how the algorithms and how uh, people consume videos is concerned, that he knows that he needs to have a 20 minute video in order to he hit a certain threshold with YouTube. But he also knows that most people don't watch to the end of the 20 minutes. And so he basically does a, a hard video that's five minutes long. Uh, one of the things that he does better than anybody else in the whole world is that he delivers the subject matter, what his video is gonna be about in the first 10 seconds of the video. Uh, I'd love to get that good, Tracy. Um, and, um, and then he sticks to it for like five minutes and then he riffs for another 15 minutes after that and the riffing is mostly just to uh, fulfill the obligation that he has to the algorithm, not necessarily to the audience. So he is really, really good at what he does. I and you know, looking at him and and um, uh, uh, Luke, who I think is also operating. I think he, Luke seems to be operating out of Tim's war van that he He's built. On vacation now. He may or may not come back. Okay. He left the pal the palatial estate. He, he left. He, left, <laughs> left, <laughs> he should have taken the damn cat with him. He left the compound. Uh, no, the thing that, that uh, yeah, I look at Luke and I look at Tim and I think, has Luke ever experimented with just turning straight into the camera the way Tim is, and having the camera Tim's camera is slightly higher and shooting down on him, and Luke's camera is lower and shooting up at him at a forty five degree angle. And he's and, also like this. Right. And and I I wonder a lot whether or not uh, if Luke played around with uh, his camera placement and the way that he's got his, his setup uh, going because uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that if he emulated uh, the camera angle uh, and, the, um, and the face position of Tim's that he might have significantly more... Um, impact with his videos. Uh, yeah. it's, just, it's just a guess, but it's easy enough to test. And, and it's, it's so interesting to me how thoughtful Tim is about that. Cause if you ever watch Tim cast him IRL, the nightly show that they do, Tim is pointing directly at a camera and just talking to that. And you mm -hmm. start noticing the eye lines really throwed me off, throw me off because I'm used to like, <laughs> doing something that's got a 
cut together nicely. And it doesn't because he will be talking to his main guest and looking off to his right like this. But when they show the guest talking to him, the guest is looking the opposite direction. So the eye lines don't match up at all. Well, that's not good. No, it's t it's awful. And I don't know where the camera is behind Tim. If you watch Rogan, you can see the camera mounts so that your the eye lines make sense when they cut back and forth between them. Yeah, but it's driving me eye nuts. Lines, eye lines are really important. I want to see I, I'm like I want to see what the hell the layout is in that room. Because you could rearrange it so that the eye lines totally work, but they don't. I keep thinking where the hell is the guest sitting? Cuz he's looking this way and then the guest is looking this way. You know, that, that doesn't work at all. Yeah, a lot of people don't uh, realize how important this stuff is. I have a friend, uh, Rick, who I went to high school with, and we used to go and hang out. He used to work at the in the in the tr uh, the trailers, NBC Sports trailers, for football games on the weekend. And he wound up getting a job for NBC Sports, and then he wound up working uh, doing game shows. Uh, for and a, a lot of people don't understand that game shows are shot. Uh, usually, they shoot twenty of them at a time, like in a in a like a two day period. Um, and then they, uh, and then they, those things, uh, roll out for several re weeks and then they shoot 20 more and then they roll them out. So there's a lot of very interesting production techniques that happen in live sports and, and game shows. And, um, when the J when the Jay Leno, um, the Jay Leno, uh, David Letterman war started a lot of, uh, uh, younger, younger people may not remember this, but, uh, for for several weeks, it was all it was all built up because Letterman was on NBC, and then they didn't give him the late night show, and they gave it to Leno, and then Len, Letterman went to CBS, and they both launched their shows at the same time. And for the first month or two, everything was uh, was uh, neck and neck. the The rating nobody was beating the other one on the ratings. They they were basically even. And um, my friend Rick got pulled in as a uh, assistant director and the producer of the show just asked him to sit in the back of the control room for a couple of days and watch the show and see if there was anything that he could do based on his experience of being in sports and game shows to try to fix the Leno show. And the solution that he came up with uh, destroyed J David Letterman. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know that he's ever shared this in public, but it's it's been 30 years. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to reveal it here, but basically what he did is he told the director, he said, put two ISO cameras in b behind Jay. Uh, part of the problem with keeping a TV show in production is, is your budget, right? And uh, every camera operator in, uh, uh, introduces a certain amount of overhead. And so uh, Rick recognized that you could put two cameras like kind of in the rafters looking over Jay's shoulder that showed the audience. Uh, uh, and you wouldn't need to have a camera operator because it could just be two locked off shots that are going into the control room. Um, and then he wanted to get an edit bay, a sports style edit bay that is in, in the trucks, uh, you'll be watching a football game or something. And when they come back from commercial, they'll show you the three best plays of what happened before they went to commercial. That's because they've got an editor sitting there that's editing that. They call that a package. And so what Rick decided, what he figured out was that um, if they started, if Leno started the show a half an hour early, that he could run every joke that was written by the writers that day. That is, what normally would happen is that there would be a 10-minute monologue, right? And you would write 10 minutes worth of jokes. And what he did is that he had them start a half an hour early and he had them run 30 minutes of jokes. So Jay would basically do a full stand-up routine. And then while Jay was interviewing the show, Rick would pull out the 10 minutes that were the best 10 minutes of jokes. Um, and then when the show went, uh, and then Rick would know how long to the second that package was because it was, you know, it was not, it was nine minutes and 30 seconds or it was 10 minutes and 15 seconds, whatever it was. And then he could tell the, uh, the stage manager or the director of the show, how much more show they needed to record in order to hit it on the, on the timeline that they needed to, to get out by. So they started doing that. And, um, Leno's 
uh, ne Leonard never looked back. Uh, and it took uh, Letterman, uh, uh, I, I don't know if Letterman ever figured out uh, <laughs> what Leno did to him, but basically Rick worked there for like 25 years after that. He had a permanent job and he just basically, and his job was to cut the monologue down every night. Um, That's uh, he rough made, too. It sounds like, cause you, you're under a tight deadline, so you can't screw it you, up. You know what? Compared to sports. And yeah, ha having true. having Don Olmeyer or 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 somebody David Hill, I, I, live sports is 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 a, a real dog eat dog business. So uh, I, he he's one of the uh, jolliest and friendliest and nicest guys that you'll ever meet. And I think that he loved his, he created a job that for himself that he loved, and he it, it was great. And I think that the world benefited from it because I think that Jay Leno's monologues were funnier than David Letterman's monologues that were often, you know, crass, off, but backbiting, um, mean, you know, not very nice. So anyway, what other questions yeah, do we have? There was a question that I wanted to get to. Uh, yes, I did finish the gang stalking book. I had finished it before we ever talked about it. So I'm rereading this book right now. It's called the Lucifer principle by Howard Bloom. And I don't know if it's on Scribd or not, but I highly recommend it. And when I finish it, I will give everybody kind of a little synopsis of it. Yeah, I'd like to know why you like that book because somebody recommended it to me once, but um, later I figured out that they're a evil, a, an evil Illuminati type person, so. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that at all. It's kind of about like the human drive and how this, um, we're driven by helping the group more than the individual, it seems. What does he say? Four hours cut to 30 minutes? Yes. I don't know if I understand this. Four hours out oh, to cut 30 minutes to 10. It's actually less than that. It's Yeah, it's less than that because he has to, because he had to tell the director during the show how many more minutes of show he had. Um, but again, this is what you do every Sunday in sports or every Saturday. Or, yes. Or, it, 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 this is just part of the normal uh, course of doing business. Oh, I think this is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Rick Stern uh, deserves an Emmy. Uh, I would say more than uh, Andrew Cuomo. Yeah. So his name is Rick Stern, the genius who came up with that idea. All right. Do you know anything about Arsenio? I, I think Arsenio's claim to fame was that um, they were, here's the, here's what Arsenio did. This, at least this is what I understood. And Arsenio lived down the hall from me when I lived behind Rock and Roll Ralphs too, um, in an apartment building. Uh, I think that the secret to Arsenio Hall was that that show, so they needed a black host and they needed to get A-list celebrities. And so what they would do is that they would reach out to publicists and what they told the publicists is that Arsenio would ask the celebrities quest questions that were delivered to them by the publicists. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's easy enough. <laughs> so basically I have a TV show. It's on late at night. It goes up against these other people and I'll talk about whatever you want me to talk about. And in, in that way, he got any guest on uh, that one. They, if they if they wanted to do Letterman or they wanted to do uh, Leno and they couldn't get on, they would they'd be a shoe in on Arsenio because Arsenio would just ask them the questions that the publicists asked, wanted them to ask. At least that's what I heard, allegedly. So. It sounds legit. Sounds more legit than the cat napping caper. But all right, I'm calling it a, a day, Peter. All right. Well, it's been terrific, everybody. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, follow us on all the usual suspects. You can find them if you go to the realityos.com. And do you want to tease uh, the uh, cognitive dissidence thing that we're doing on uh, on um, Clubhouse? Maybe we can share it up in uh, the locals and maybe on the Telegram. Okay, yeah, and I have one qualifier too I wanted to end with. Uh, I probably <laughs> should have said this earlier is that I did work on the NASA thing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago and I did try to replicate Jay Widener's uh, uh, experiment that I had replicated before. 
uh, I couldn't find the exact files in order to do it again. And so I went and I, on Flickr, I found some high res uh, Apollo 11 scans, 1800 DPI scans. And I tried to use those to replicate uh, the, uh, the contention that Jay Widener had about uh, the Apollo moonshots using front screen projection. And I was not able to reproduce it. I had done it before with a, a, a processed image but with the high resolution images, I wasn't able to do it. Um, and so uh, I apologize to anybody who is waiting for that video because uh, I haven't been able to execute on it because my assumption was was uh, incorrect. So I'll All just- right. So if somebody else can find those photos that Peter's talking about and send them to us, we would appreciate it. Indeed. All right. Our and well, do we want to tease who's on next week real quickly? Oh yeah, uh, we're going to have Carpe Donctum on next week, uh, Carpe Doctum, who was in the White House on election night, the way that he describes it, uh, it was all of the most famous people in politics and him. <laughs> Great. And I don't know that he's going to want to talk too much about it, but uh, he, he really wants to kind of stay away from politics at this point. So we're going to talk about the state of memes and uh, information warfare. And, right. uh, and we're World War meme. I'm already calling it that. All right. Very good. Talk to you later, Tracy. All right. All right See bye -bye. you next week, everybody. Bye-bye.